Good afternoon. <laughs> I had a microphone. Hello, welcome to today's program. I'm Nori Brahim, and I've had the pleasure of working with the co-chairs of the Health Policy Working Group to bring this program together. And um, in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to one of its chairs, Jim Nickman. But I just want to mention that next week, we're going to be sending out some correspondence asking you to get involved on different committees. And one of them is the Health Policy Working Group. And we're going to be looking for people to serve on the committee and leadership roles. So if you have an interest, please get in touch and let us know what you'd like to do. I'd also like to mention that we're live streaming today's program to members of Grantmakers in Health and the Grantmakers Forum of New York. And we're also tweeting the program. So if you'd like to get involved online, you can tweet using hashtag PNY event. It's also up there. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jim Dickman. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. I think this is going to be a great event, uh, lots to learn and lots to do. And, um, uh, you know, the idea of this, uh, of this uh, health policy working group is to get foundations in New York uh, to work collaboratively and to learn from one another. And I think today is going to be a perfect example of that, uh, and uh, we're all anxious to hear about it. I, um, uh, and it's such a complicated law, and it's such an important law, and I think as we work through today, uh, I think we'll all see um, ways that we can contribute as philanthropies. And it's interesting, uh, you know, our, our group really defines health in a broad way, so the health and well-being, and I think a lot of foundations, whether they do health care policy or they do well-being of, of uh, individual people who are vulnerable, uh, there are lots of things uh, to get involved in here. So really please. I'd like to really thank uh, uh, Corey for uh, really putting this together and, um, and really designing a, a, a great agenda. You know, she has so many superstars and so many uh, topics to cover, but she really has uh, developed a plan that I think will get us uh, the information uh, we're all looking for and get us to um, a point where we can all have a discussion together. So thank you. Corey, of course, is head of the Hartford uh, uh, Foundation, a veteran uh, uh, foundation leader, and, and their organization has done so much much in uh, uh, geriatrics and in uh, workforce and lots of the uh, lots of issues that are really central to the successful implementation of this program. So I'm going to turn it over to Corey. Thank you. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Okay, good. Okay. Uh, look at Jim, thank you very, very much. Uh, I'd also like to add my welcome to all of you in the audience and also those of you that are on the web and uh, hearing us by telephone. Um, the panel and I are delighted uh, to be here to speak. Closer? Okay, thank you. Delighted to be here to speak uh, about how philanthropy will respond to the Supreme Court's ruling on the Affordable Care Act. Before turning to the program, I would like to thank the program's co-chairs, Betsy and Jim, and the leadership of Philanthropy New York, uh, especially Rana, uh, Noor, and Michael for organizing this event. They really organized it, uh, not me. I think your timing could not be better. Not only has the Supreme Court largely upheld the ACA, but we have now had a couple of weeks to take stock of their decision and where we need to go from here to meet all of our goals, better health care, better health, and reduce costs through improvement, the triple aim. I'm going to begin by introducing each of our panel members in, in the order that they'll be speaking uh, by mentioning just their current jobs, but I urge you to uh, read their full bios that are in the materials that you have. Uh, first, Susan Denzer, right in the middle, is the Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs, the nation's leading journal of health policy, and is an on-air analyst with the PBS NewsHour. Jim Talon, down at the end, is president of the United Hospital Fund of New York, uh, chair of the Commonwealth Fund, and the Kaiser Commission on Medicaid and the Uninsured. Uh, David Cutler, to my left, is the Otto Eckstein Professor of Applied uh, Economics at Harvard University and holds joint appointments at the Kennedy School of Government and the School of Public Health. Joe Baker, next to him, is president of the Medicare Rights Center and a member of the Institute of Medicine's Board on Healthcare Service. And next to Susan is uh, Marjorie uh, Cadogan. She's the Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Human Resources Administration's Office of Citywide Health Insurance Access in New York City. She also oversees uh, the Mayor's Health Staff Initiative, 
which seeks to connect New Yorkers. Okay. <laughs> Just advice to all of you. You have yeah. to be very close <laughs> where, where you're talking. Overseas America uh, seeks to con uh, connect New Yorkers to public health insurance. As you can see, we really have an outstanding and very knowledgeable panel. Uh, one uh, process suggestion, I'm going to ask you to save your questions until all of our panelists have spoken. And I'm going to begin with uh, Susan Benzer, who will give us a brief overview of the law and the Supreme Court's decision. Susan? Thank you very much, Corey, and good afternoon to all of you. It's great to be here with you. So my job is in 10 minutes to give you everything you need to know or wanted to know or maybe didn't even want to know about uh, what the Supreme Court decided on the Affordable Care Act. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask you to crane your necks you know, uh, 90 degrees <laughs> to walk through some slides. Uh, you can see them over there. You see I adopted the old New York spelling of New York. It had an E at the end of it. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's a typo. <laughs> but. The rest of this is quite accurate, I assure you. Okay. So what were the issues, literally, before our fine Supreme Court uh, as they took this case up late last year? They fell into several categories. First was the applicability of the Tax Anti-Injunction Act, which literally, to boil it all down, meant could the court rule on this now? or did the court have to wait until 2015? The Tax Anti-Injunction Act was passed during Reconstruction after the Civil War when the government was basically, <laughs> when the government was uh, collecting a lot of taxes, people were unhappy then as they are now, and many people were suing to void the tax before it was actually collected. So law was passed that said you can't sue anymore to void a federal tax until it's actually collected. So by this reasoning, then the uh, a case could not be brought against the Affordable Care Act till the penalty for not complying with the individual mandate would first be collected, which would actually be 2015. So the first order of business was, can we decide this now or do we have to wait till 2015? Second order of business was, is the individual mandate constitutional? Is it, uh, are there various avenues in the Constitution that would say the government has the right to tell people that you've got to buy health insurance or pay a penalty uh, under certain circumstances because, of course, as we know, many people were going to be exempt from the mandate. Uh, specifically, there were a couple of arguments were made by people on either side. One is, does the Congress have the authority by virtue of the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause of the Constitution to regulate the interstate market of health insurance and health care in such a way that they could in pose this uh, requirement of the individual mandate. Or, if not that, did the government have the power to do that under the taxing power? Uh, those were the three arguments made. The, most of the attention got focused on the first two arguments, the commerce clause and the necessary and proper clause. And the government, the U.S. government, made the point that they could probably also do it under the taxing power, but everybody ignored that, and almost every court ignored that. And so keep that in mind, because it turns out to be the avenue which the court found it constitutional. Uh, the next argument was severability. If the mandate is unconstitutional, does some of the law, or does all of the law go down with it, or does the rest of the law stand? Is the mandate really the linchpin of the law? Is it the centerpiece of the law, or is it just another piece of the law? Then the final argument was the Medicaid expansion. As you know, under the law, uh, states were going to be required to expand their Medicaid populations to all enrollees under 133% of the federal poverty level, 138% to be technical about it, uh, and would get uh, federal contributions that were higher than the traditional federal contributions uh, known as the match to expand coverage. Literally 100% federal contributions for the first two years followed uh, drops down to 95% and then bottoms out at 90% and this is on average about 20 to 30 percent which points higher than the average federal contribution for Medicaid. And the, many of the states, 26 of them argued that there were two, two problems with that. One is it was too good a deal. It was too good a deal for the federal government to pick up that much money. States had no free will. Uh, it's like having somebody come in and promise you they're going to buy every lunch and every dinner. You can't possibly say no. That was one argument. The second argument they were making 
is that because in the law there was a, a um, restriction that said that if the states do not expand their coverage to 133 percent of the poverty level in Medicaid, the secretary could withhold all funding for Medicaid for the states. And the states said that was unduly coercive because it left them no option but to expand coverage. So the states were making those two arguments. Well, we know how the court eventually decided. It decided, in effect, that the mandate was a tax and could stand under the taxing power of the Constitution. But it gets, it's a little bit more complicated than that, so let's delve a little bit more deeply into the reasoning. So by five to four, the court ruled, first of all, the Tax Anti-Injunction Act did not apply in this case and did not uh, forbid the uh, case from proceeding. The reason was that the penalty for not complying with the mandate was not an actual tax, per se, because it was described in the law as a penalty, not a tax. And Congress didn't intend the payment to be treated as a tax for the purposes of the Anti-Injunction Act. So that's how the court decided we can get over this barrier of the Anti-Injunction Act. And it further said that label cannot control whether the payment is a tax for the purposes of the Constitution but it does determine uh, that the validity of it for the application of the anti-injunction tax. Okay, so that was number one. On the constitutionality of the individual mandate, the court actually said uh, the, the, uh, unequivocally the Congress does not have the authority to do this under the Commerce Clause. It does not have the authority to compel you to buy health insurance. It cannot compel commercial activity that is not going on and therefore, it is not constitutional under the Commerce Clause or the Necessary and Proper Clause. However, the court went on to say, it does have the authority under the taxing power to do this. What the, literally in the Constitution, it says it's the power to lay and collect taxes for the general welfare. So under that power, the government would determine it is for the general welfare that everybody have health insurance. If you choose not to have health insurance, it is for the general welfare that you should pay a penalty that will then go to subsidize coverage for everybody else who does want to have health insurance. That is constitutional. That is under the federal authority in the Constitution. So this is why what disturbed so many people on the other side of the ruling because it seemed as if the court was saying on the one hand, it's not a tax for the purpose of the Anti-Injunction Act, but it is a tax for the purpose of this. And yes, it seems that way, but the court was really emphasizing this power to lay and collect taxes for the general welfare and saying, in this construct, you should see the penalty as analogous to a tax for that purpose. The other point that just Chief Justice Roberts made is that uh, existing case law has held that if there are two avenues to find something constitutional and one of them turns out not to be constitutional, the courts are obligated to say you can pursue something by the second avenue. The courts can't just say, well, we don't really like this, so we're going to call it unconstitutional. If there's any way the power can be held constitutional, the courts have an obligation to find it that way. So that's in effect what the court did here. It said you can't take this road, but you can take this road uh, to find this constitutional. On severability, the court uh, ruled overall that the other provisions of the Affordable Care Act were not affected by this. Uh, that the Congress wanted the rest of the act to stand, even though there wasn't clear severability language in the statute, uh, the courts, the, 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 the Congress would have wanted the whole act to stand. The sleeper issue turned out to be this Medicaid expansion issue. Uh, and the court ruled that actually the Medicaid expansion violated the Constitution by threatening states with the loss of their other Medicaid funding if they did not comply with the expansion. Uh, now, interestingly, Chief Justice Roberts led the, the, uh, more, the a majority once again in saying, but we can fix that by saying clearly that the Secretary does not have the authority to cut off all of the Medicaid funding. And if we fix that by saying she doesn't have the authority to do this, then uh, the, not only can the rest of the law proceed, but the Medicaid expansion can proceed. Essentially what the court was saying is now the Medicaid expansion is constitutional, 
but without this enforcement power that the secretary has. Therefore, the states in effect have an option not to pursue the expansion if they want to do that and the secretary can't come back and take away all their funding. So the states now have a clear path to decide not to proceed with the expansion if they want to. Now that was the majority, uh, which of course is what, what mattered in the end. The four dissenting justices, the four conservative justices, disagreed on almost every piece of that argument. First of all, they said the act exceeds federal power in both mandating the purchase of insurance and the Medicaid expansion. They said those parts of the act are central to the design and operation of the law. Therefore, it must follow that the whole statute is inoperative. And they went through systematically, piece by major piece of the law, and said all of these, all of these are unconstitutional. All of them are out. Well, that was four, though. The five ruled the other way. And on the Medicaid piece, actually, there was an even larger majority. So how should all of this be interpreted? Well. Of course, the overall law now is upheld as constitutional. The Medicaid expansion is constitutional, but states now have the ability to opt out without losing all of their Medicaid funding. What does this mean in practical terms? It means that now states actually have a choice. They can choose to have their citizens who are between 100% and 133% of the federal poverty level go into the health insurance exchanges and receive federal subsidies and get their coverage that way. They don't have to have them enrolled in Medicaid. They can take this path if they want to go that way. For citizens below 100% of the federal poverty level, and there is a healthy core of them that uh, would be picked up in the Medicaid expansion. We don't know exactly how many, but it's probably somewhere around 10 million people. Uh, for those citizens below 100% of the federal poverty level, there is no option under the Affordable Care Act for them to get coverage except through Medicaid. So if the states do not elect to expand Medicaid, that part of their population will not get coverage. And this is particularly important in the states with the highest uh, levels of, of uninsurance because a good portion of the people who don't have insurance in those states are single adults, adults without dependent children, and the others who have historically been out of the Medicaid program and are below poverty. And just in case uh, you don't have the federal poverty level numbers etched in your head, let's remember that 100% of the federal poverty level is $11,700 for a single person. So in a good number of states, those people, a single adult with that much income, is too well off to qualify for Medicaid. Now. The other bottom line is that for all other aspects of the law, implementation moves forward, at least until the law is changed again, if it is. Uh, so the exchanges go forward. The, uh, what remains of the prevention and public health fund is still intact. Uh, grants continue to go out to the states. Lots of uh, delivery and payment system innovation moves forward. Every other piece of the law moves forward for now. Now, of course, this is um, one of my favorite charts from the Pew Research Center. The country had a, a range of reactions to this. This is people were asked in a poll that Pew did to uh, express the words that they thought best invoked the decision. You can see disappointed, surprised, good, happy, disgusted. And then, of course, eight very eloquent Americans said that it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see the, uh, the reaction, of course, was all over the map. Uh, but it, I, and it, that is, of course, the reality now facing the Affordable Care Act. Where are we headed? This is one of my favorite uh, cartoons on the subject. You can see the pollster shows up at the family home and the man says, I'm for the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, but I'm opposed to Obamacare. And that is pretty much where we seem to be as a country here, completely bollocked up on what it is we want or where we're going to go from here. So with that, I think now we've uh, arranged to have everybody take it right. a few, a couple of minutes to just express their top line. And you exactly. could choose one of those words that I put up there if you like, right. or something else. Well, I, I know the panel is uh, more than that. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is have each of you uh, take two minutes or less and describe your reaction to the court's decision. And tell us what you think is the most striking change that's happened since that decision. Jim, can we start with you? Uh, you know, first reaction is interesting because for the first eight or nine minutes, remember, we had the wrong story. Uh, 
and, and that's that's some, actually some had the wrong so, story. Some, some, a large a large number of the American people had the wrong story from a news source, CNN, uh, and and a couple of the others. But uh, I mean, Fox actually had the same story, but Fox just said we're right, the court's wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but that's that's kind of important. If I go back to the day of the oral argument when CNN for the entire afternoon. Uh, ran uh, the headline uh, that the, the uh, government's case was a train wreck. In, in other words, I just go back to... Not just a train wreck. Plane wreck. Plane, plane wreck. It's a plane wreck. I remember train wreck. I guess I, I moderate these things. Uh, but observation number one, uh, and you came to it at the end, uh, the question of information and, and the cartoon tells a story. A real issue here in which we are so, and this is before we even get to the paid advertising in the fall, that we're just having a hard time understanding some of the basics. Uh, and part of it is because of the, the, the focus of uh, at least ma major components of our news media on speed ahead of accuracy. Uh, secondly, uh, other observation. Once I didn't really have time in those moments to really fully reflect that my career had just collapsed. Uh, so when I got to the decision, uh, second point, it's the law of the land. And what that means now is that somebody else has to change it. And uh, uh, the third point I would make, the history of this will tell how the Chief Ju Justice uh, played this thing out. But it looks to me as if on the issues before the court, the constitutional issues, he largely agreed with the dissenters. Uh, but I think he looked at the dissenters and they were clear, they were prepared to take the entire law down. And the chief uh, justice, and he says it, he said the American people get to make whatever political decisions they want to, even if they made the wrong one. Um, he didn't say that. That was the implication. Almost. <laughs> but, he, but he almost said that. And so he made a very important decision about the nature of the court, uh, and, and people can get off into, uh, into that discussion. Finally, on the, on the Medicaid piece, and I guess my reaction uh, to it, I was a little surprised by the Medicaid piece. Obviously, you can go back to the 30s and just find case after case, circumstance after circumstance of federal spending. This is the first time the, the court pushes back on the spending authority of the Congress vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the states. And uh, that's significant. Two observations. In the time since we've seen the court decision, uh, we've seen half a dozen governors, in effect, walk away from Medicaid and say, I'm not going to do it. And to me, the important observation here is we're not discussing repeal and replace. The message coming out of those governors is we're actually going to walk away from this issue. And this is the first time for me in this debate that there's been a major political focus on simply saying we're not going to solve this problem from one point of view. I think that throws a lot of challenges to the rest of the conservative coalition about whether you're really prepared to go, to go that far. Final comment, and, um, and I'm probably I'll diverge from a lot of other folks of uh, my political persuasion on, on this. Uh, I actually uh, would rather be in a situation with the states where I was using the economic incentives to gain state participation uh, than going into a, a pitched battle over federal authority with uh, a dozen or more recalcitrant states. As you play out 15, 16, 17, if we get, we get past this year, we let the, uh, the tempers uh, and the rhetoric cool down if it, if it ever does. A lot of states, both because of the opportunity of federal money and because of the coalitions of politics in their states, are going to come to a decision to come along with this. So I, I, rather than having a pitched battle reminiscent uh, of the civil rights battles and others between federal authority and states' rights, I actually think the court may, in a practical sense, have opened up a better way to move forward in those states that traditionally have been unwilling to uh, serve uh, uh, the, a higher uh, share of their poor populations. There, that's uh, five minutes worth of two minutes. Okay. Marjorie, uh, your two minutes, your reaction. 
well, I'm going to take this from a local lens because I'm really speaking from a New York City-centric uh, point of view. I have to say I personally was surprised um, because I did feel, based on what I had heard of oral argument and so on, that the uh, individual mandate part of the law was really going to be at issue. So I was surprised but very pleased that now um, that which kind of had us all in suspended animation was done. Um, we could say our phew and move on to the work. Um, and at the Human Resources Administration in, in my office, it's about the work and it's about implementation. And there is so much to do that this period of wait and see was really um, harmful in our ability to really think ahead. Certainly not for the state, because the state has been active um, in thinking about and moving forward toward establishing its exchange and taking advantage of the ACA from the time that the law was passed. Um, but the rest of us are ready to move forward as well. And in New York City, we have a great deal of work to do with still 1.2 million New Yorkers uninsured. So having the tools that are at hand from the ACA now at our fingertips, and hopefully they can be fully realized at the state and federal level, even with the flip of the expansion part of the decision, um, we have some real new groundwork um, and new tools to get the job done. Susan. Uh, why don't I just pass <laughs> for now? Yeah. You, you've heard enough from me. Um, well, I think uh, I would agree. Uh, some surprise. I will, I will admit to some delight um, in the uh, initial moments. And then I think a feeling of, uh, as I read the decision, and certainly you know, can't remember my initial reaction because it's kind of colored by the last few weeks of uh, you know, various reactions to it including, as Jim was mentioning, various state governors, uh, Rick Perry, the governor of Maine, uh, and the governor of Maine, um, uh, kind of, you know, we're not done yet uh, uh, feeling. And um, I would actually agree with Jim uh, on his last comment about even though, you know, I was a big proponent of the Medicaid expansion, you know, having worked to, with Medicaid in New York State, uh, you know, the sense of the Medicaid program being 50 separate programs as opposed to one program was something that <clears throat> definitely is a problem, uh, not only at the national level, but at the state level, of course. Um, but, uh, and it certainly is a problem for beneficiaries of the, of the program. Uh, you know, it, it, it does, uh, as they move from state to state, and that does happen, uh, believe it or not. Um, but this sense that um, there is a political opportunity here you know, I remember, Jim, when you were first talking about the exchange and the mandate, and uh, I think you got it right that, you know, we were never going to depend upon the mandate to really cover people. You know, that was, if we were going to have to depend upon the mandate to get people covered, it was going to be a failed program. Um, really what we needed to do was have affordable, attractive insurance pro products available to people so that, you know, they didn't want, you know, to, to opt out. They wanted to buy insurance, and that's what most people want to do. I think what will happen, as you're saying, is that we have a period of time ahead of us um, to uh, convince states or to have the political infrastructure of those states convince those governors um, or that electorate uh, that this is the right thing to do. And it's certainly you've seen in press articles a lot of governors bloviating about, you know, we're not going to do this. Um, and this is, you know, overreaching federal power. You've also seen in those same articles or in other articles, hospital associations, other provider groups, you know, others within the state saying, well, we're still, you know, talking about this, you know, being very careful um, because they don't want to alienate their governor, but also, you know, definitely saying this isn't over. This debate isn't over in our state. Um, and certainly it's not over uh, nationwide. I think the fear that I have is a, a stance like the governor of Maine um, who, you know, basically says, oh, okay, uh, this also means that they really didn't uphold, you know, the rest of the Medicaid, uh, you know, as, as Susan so excellently pointed out, the rest of the law stands. I mean, this is a, a you know, mandatory new class of folks. Um, all of the other improvements to Medicaid, the maintenance of effort, et cetera, all still stand. You know, but the governor of Maine is saying, no, that's not how he reads the decision. So, you know, I don't think we're done yet either in the context of, um, you know, litigation perhaps. Um, but I do think it creates, um, you know, lack of a better way of putting it, another 
uh, but maybe a better uh, political opportunity to kind of get the states to take this on themselves. Um, it would have been nice to have done it with the stroke of this law um, for Medicaid, uh, but it doesn't look like it's going to pan out that way, but it doesn't mean it's not going to happen and that the, the fight isn't still a very good fight and I think still very winnable with coalitions of consumers, coalitions of providers um, in particular states and with other states showing the way, like New York, I think. Um, you know, there will be this tremendous pressure on these other states. Why are we letting uh, these, these federal dollars flow to these states and not to our state? Why are, you know, our tax dollars going to Washington and going to New York except and not coming back to Texas or Maine? So I think those are the kinds of things that you're going to start hearing once, you know, the political, uh, uh, you know, machine gets uh, moving again in those states around health care. Thank you. David? Um, my first reaction was, be grateful that I'm an economist and not a lawyer, which I have subsequently come to believe even more strongly than I did initially. That is, um, as an economist, as I read the decision, the economic analysis of it just makes no sense from start to end. The decision looks like it was pulled out of thin air, which it, as Susan pointed out, although I'm being somewhat less delicate than she was it sort of it, the whole thing has that feel of being pulled out. So it's just, it, it's not a very strong house to be building things on. The, the, the part which, um, so that part disappoints me. I suppose the part which disappoints me more is that what, what you're now seeing, even if they reverse it, what you're now seeing is amongst you know, most of the Republicans, this sort of hostility towards anyone having insurance coverage towards the medical industry, which is by and large in favor of the law, towards doing anything to try and improve um, health care other than just block granting Medicaid, sticking the problem on someone else's back, washing our hands of it and saying we don't, we don't need it and, and it would be better off without it. And this is um, more reactionary than I've ever seen a party be. I, 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 I am wrote a blog post which got picked up in Bill Keller's column this past week. And the, the line he picked up was, um, was something that I suspect is true, which is that Mitt Romney is the first candidate to ever run for president with the platform that too many people have health insurance coverage. <laughs> and that's sort of where one half of the political party is, is sort of saying that that's a big problem that too many people have too much stuff and they ought to just be happy to not, not they ought to not get it and, and be happy with that. And I find that a very um, unfortunate circumstance. Thank you very much, David. We're now going to turn to the main issues and I'm going to call upon uh, Jim to make sense for us or help us make sense of the current political situation oh. related to <laughs> the Affordable Care Act. Uh, David just uh, raised an important point about how the politics are in the, in the short term pulling apart. But let me uh, uh, let, let me kind of just step back and uh, look. I mean, everybody is uh, uh, can be their own uh, their own expert on this subject. Uh, within 2012, uh, I, I've kind of said this is this is the triple crown. Okay, the the the, the Supreme Court decision was the Kentucky Derby. Uh, and Obamacare won the Derby. Uh, now we're the, do the breakness. Uh, it really doesn't work, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Uh, and, and that's the election. Uh, and the election, uh, the polling this morning uh, uh, would suggest to you the elections uh, in the balance, hangs in the balance on, on the presidency. Uh, and it also in the Congress, uh, there's probably uh, I don't follow this stuff. Uh, in, in any detail at all, probably an assumption that the Republicans hold, uh, continue to hold the House and maybe gain some seats, and probably gain some seats in the uh, Senate. Do they get to a majority in the Senate? Do they get to 50 uh, or whatever? But the second round of this is the election, and we're all going to uh, wake up on, on uh, the uh, morning after Election Day. I hope it's settled. Uh, and we're going to have seen the second uh, uh, leg of this uh, and. I'm not sure what the outcome is at this point. Uh, I think out of this, uh, Democrats clearly came out uh, with a little bit of a spring in their step. 
uh, that hadn't been there for a while, and that is helpful to the president. I think if you go to when they, if you had gone to what the dissenters wanted to do, take the entire law down, uh, uh, it's uh, John King uh, at his magic board in those magic minutes. Uh, the quote uh, on CNN again from John King is, this is a big defeat for Obama, this is a huge defeat for the Democratic Party, In the before they Wolf flipped it around and said, no, that's not the right story. <laughs> so clearly neg negative uh, would have hurt, but I, you know, the election, we're all living it, and uh, we'll see how it plays out. It matters to me, this is not the place to uh, debate it, or maybe it is, but... Uh, uh, third, uh, we then get to the Belmont Stakes. Remember, the Belmont Stakes are the longest and most grueling uh, leg in the, in the uh, racing triple crown. Mile and a half, all the horses get tired before they get to the end. We've got the uh, debt ceiling. Uh, we've got the expiration of the tax cuts. We've got a sequester built into the budget, an automatic sequester of more than a trillion dollars, half of which comes out of defense. Uh, so. The lame duck Congress owns an enormous number of issues. And remember, this stuff, uh, 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 Susan and I were having a little back and forth earlier about whether they can get to an agreement or whether they continue to, to, to play the thing out. My sense is that markets may be able to hold their breath until December, but, you know, it, it's not my world. But there's a whole lot of stuff up in the air. Last August, they, they showed us how crazy the discussion can get. Uh, and now they have another opportunity uh, to show us, even, even if they can make it crazier, or whether they can get this to, to sanity. And I don't even know what sanity is, because it's going to involve an awful lot of compromise and change. But remember, 2012, on New Year's Eve, we're going to look back at the Supreme Court decision as just step one, and there's two other big steps uh, that are out there. Uh, Second observation, and I'll try to pick up the pace at, at this point. It, look, it's a historic law in any sense, uh, whether you want to start back at Teddy Roosevelt, or you want to go to FDR, you want to look at Truman, you want to look at Kennedy and LBJ, you want to look at uh, Carter, you want to look at Clinton. I mean, I mean take uh, 100 years, uh, and this is the law of the land. That is a really big difference. And I would suggest to anybody, just as an interest, lots of commentary to read, read the Supreme Court decision. Uh, you will fire if, if you're if you're here and you care enough about this. Take the couple of hours that it will take you during the summer reading to read what the chief judge said, uh, to read uh, the dissents uh, on all sides of this, and understand a, a lot in a sense of the richness of the debate about the American experience. Uh, I mean, it is it is one of the big ones uh, in our history, and it will be referred to as that. Uh, I remind everybody uh, that in, am I right to my Commonwealth friends, in July of 2008, the Finance Committee holds a seminar at the Library of Congress in which most of the members of the Finance Committee from both, U.S. Senate Finance Committee from both parties come and have a day-long seminar with outside experts. David, were you, you there? I'm going to assume that you were part of this. Uh, and they uh, do a discussion about how are we going to move forward. And they are having discussions. John Kerry is looking across the table at Orrin Hatch, and they're having discussions with one another. But this is the middle of, of, of 2008. We are having an honest bipartisan discussion that is sort of the extension, and this is not a shot at, at Governor Romney, but in Massachusetts, in the middle of the decade, the consensus was adopted. And the consensus is said was we can go to the more uh, individual market, market-based competition, rough uh, fundamentalist view on competition, or we can go off to, to, to a single-payer nirvana. We're not going to go there. We're not going to go in either of these directions. Let's take what we have, let's build on it, and that's the Affordable Care Act. That is largely a consensus discussion just six years ago. Then the politics further, uh, wh whether we get out of the, uh, come into the uh, financial collapse of, of uh, September of uh, 2008, the president uh, is elected in, in large respect because the McCain campaign falls apart uh, after the financial uh, collapse. President gets a pretty good win and we go down the road uh, that 
the pre and the president in the beginning of 2010, having lost the seat in Massachusetts, makes a decision to say, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and do this. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and move this thing and move it forward to law. Nancy Pelosi plays a very big role uh, in this. But during this period of time, uh, and David points to it, the Republican Party redefines itself in a much, much more conservative fashion. And, and really, the framing of the discussion now is fundamentally different in terms of our commitment as a society, the purposes of government, our ability to bring things together, we are now in a very, very different uh, decision. How it plays out over the rest of the year is going to be determined by the American people. That's kind of what the, what the Chief Justice says. I do want to go back to a point. The interest groups, the traditional interest groups, remember, everybody who had a financial stake in this was on board with the decision. Uh, and so, I'll cl I close with this. To me, and, and I, many of you know that I, I served in the State Assembly for uh, 19 years before coming to my current job here in New York. Uh, I guess a politics in which the fundamental politics go ideological and go, sort of go to this grassroots ide ideologically driven and all the interest groups in, in my world of politics, when you get all the interest groups on one side, in, in the history of this, they don't lose. But here they are, we are pulling apart, uh, and, and I don't know how the election is going to come out, and I don't know where uh, this uh, discussion is going to be going, uh, going forward. Uh, final comment. A lesson from all those years of politics. When you, uh, when you feel most in trouble, and you really feel that you're on your back, count on your opponents to overplay their hand. <laughs> Thanks, Jim, very much. Um, David, we're going to now turn to you for uh, finance and uh, quality issues. OK. Um, let me uh, try and bring a, a little bit of enlightenment there, although um, I suppose, like Susan, if I'm talking about bending the cost curve, first I'll have you bend the net curve. Um, <laughs> and just um, uh, and, and, and just uh, point out a few things. I, I should start, I suppose, with uh, I found one example of bipartisan good news um, in healthcare. Um, so, Susan, let never say there isn't any. Uh, eventually, American healthcare devolved to the point where patients with common illnesses or injuries were simply told to stay in the waiting room until they healed on their own. Uh, unsurprisingly, Congress hailed this as a landmark piece of bipartisan legislation. <laughs> So there you go. That's the that's the 2013 congressional agenda. Um, let me let me talk a little bit about a, a, a different feature of the Affordable Care Act than what we're talking about, because really the Affordable Care Act is actually two bills. And I don't I don't want to do this so much in the context of the Affordable Care Act, but I do want to sort of give you a sense of what the other bill is. So the first bill, which got all the attention, is the coverage bill. So that extends coverage to about 30 million of the 50 million uninsured. It reduces the cost of the Medicare program to pay for it by basically taking everything that has an H in its name and paying less to it. So a hospital or a home health agency, or if, if you've got an H, then you, then you get less money. Um, and that's a fairly traditional kind of thing. But then there's another part of the bill, which was an attempt to do things to um, start a path to real reform. And I want to pick that up because I think that this is going to be the central element of the next decade in healthcare. Whether the Affordable Care Act is a part of that decade or not, I think this is really what's going to define the decade. And so let me tell you a little bit about what I mean here. It has to do with thinking about the cost and quality of healthcare and the basic fact that I suspect nobody on this panel would disagree with, um, although if they do, they should certainly say so, is that medical care costs too much and delivers too little. Now, actually, I'm just going to, uh, I'm not going to do this very much, but I'm just going to take one quiz of the audience, which is to see if you agree with this. So how many of you agree with this? Remember, this is not Chicago, so you can only vote once. <laughs> and this is not Florida, so try to vote for the thing you intend to vote for. <laughs> so how many people agree with this? How many people disagree with this? Okay, so I want to be a nerdy economist, and I actually want to put some numbers behind this. 
So our best guess as economists is about one third of all the dollars in the medical care system are not necessary. And this is from work, I think Susan or Jim was mentioning Don Berwick's um, uh, uh, work on this, but uh, it, this sort of follows up work that the Institute of Medicine and other folks have done, basically laying out areas where medical care seems to be um, taking up more resources than it needs to. Remember that medical system is about a two and a half trillion dollar system. So a third of that is close to a trillion dollars. So our best guess is that we're wasting, you know, a bank bailout or a stimulus bill every year, just kind of dumping it in the East River on top of poor Jimmy Hoffa. Um, so how are we doing that? Well, a good deal of it is poor care delivery, unnecessary use of services, um, failure to deliver care the right way that is making mistakes and infections and hospital readmissions and so on, not coordinating care well enough um, across people. So uh, a good part of it is that. Another part of it is excessive prices. I'll show you one chart from Massachusetts in just a second showing you the range of price variation um, and it's really astronomical. Administrative costs are a very, very big deal. Um, most hospitals in the country spend about 10 cents of every dollar they collect just collecting that dollar which depending on how you rank them makes them between 10 and 100 times more inefficient than most businesses. Um, and then uh, fraud uh, and abuse are uh, clearly important, particularly in some areas uh, of the country. I promised you a little bit on price variation. Here's just a, a bit of it. You can see the price difference. These are for relatively standard um, treatments in Massachusetts. Nobody thinks it would be any different if you looked at it in other areas of the country. But ranges of variation on the order of, you know, a third to 50 percent, um, sometimes even more than that. Abdominal CT scans, for example, in Massachusetts range from 400 to 1400 dollars. They have nothing to do with quality. If you correlate the prices with reported quality metrics, you get basically zero correlation. What it has to do with is market power and it has to do with poorly informed um, people just going where they're told to go or wherever is closest or what, whatever it is and so they wind up paying high prices even though right now they're actually um, at, at a lot of financial exposure. So there are a lot of people for whom you know, the difference between a $400 and a $900 CT scan is $500 of income for their family at that moment and they still wind up paying the $900 version of this. Um, so how do people make sense of this and uh, I promise I will get to what the what the law is trying to do and what are the big issues here. But um, the way that I make sense of it is basically by thinking about people over their life cycle where they typically start healthier, we hope we start healthy, and then develop various chronic illnesses and then those chronic illnesses become acute complications. Um, and most of the medical spending is when people get very sick, that is when they're in acute and they need acute care in post-acute care settings. We actually spend relatively little on caring for people when they're healthy and relatively little on caring for people with chronic disease, which is somewhat unfortunate. That's where we want to spend more. Here's the thing that as an economist or as a policy community looks at healthcare that they most bemoan. What they most bemoan is that the way we organize healthcare is around all those little boxes. So we have a primary care doctor box and a specialist doctor box and a hospital doctor box pharmaceutical and a lab and a home health agency and a nursing home and a rehab hospital and a long-term care hospital. I could go on for days with the list of how we organize or organize the boxes. And, and in fact, that's not related to anything that anybody wants. What people really want is, okay, when I have something wrong with me, who's going to fix it and get me as well as I can be? Or when I'm healthy, who's going to help me maintain my health? So the basic phenomenon as an economist looks at this is that we have a total mismatch between what the system, the way the system is organized and what we want it to deliver. And anytime an economist looks at that, they say, if you want it to deliver a particular thing, like better caring for people with acute care episodes, then you better organize it around better caring for people with acute care episodes. Or if you want it to organize itself around better prevention, then you better organize a system so that better prevention is one of the things that comes out of that system. And we have a number of very good examples from around the country where organizations have taken 
different approaches to thinking about medical care, from primary care, Kaiser and the Mayo Clinic are exemplary, exemplary along those margins, to acute care, focusing on either cabbage surgery or preterm births or back surgery. We spend about uh, $85 billion a year treating lower back pain. How many of you have ever had lower back pain? Nine out of 10 Americans will at some point in their life. We spend about $85 billion a year treating it. And our best guess is that about $45 billion a year of that is wasted. Because most back pain actually resolves itself with a little bit of physical therapy. And yet we do the orthopedist and the MRI and the surgery and so on. I actually went to the head of the physicians group at Massachusetts General Hospital. I said, you know, as I read the literature, the only thing you need to give for 95% of the patients with back pain is physical therapy, right? And in three weeks, they're better. Am I reading the literature right? He said, no, you're not. I said, okay, tell me, tell me what's right. He said, you don't actually need the physical therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you're just pretending to do something while the body heals itself. If you want, that's a pretty cheap way to pretend to do something, but that's actually not doing much for you either. Um, so I suppose that that could be an underestimate. What all of those examples have in common is that what, what all those examples did, they went to the doctors and they said, help us identify the best care, not the most cost-effective care, not the care that's not going to break the budget, but tell us, according to the clinical guidelines, what the best care is. We, the organization, will write a computer code that makes sure that whatever happens to a patient, they go through a flow chart and wind up with the best care. So get the test result based on the test result, do A or B. If they respond to the drug, keep doing it. If they don't respond, do something else. So they come up with these elaborate flow charts where the goal is at the bottom, the treatment for the patient. So I want that patient to recover as best as they can or to remain healthy as long as they can. Okay. And then you implement this, and what you find is that you eliminate the surgeries you don't need, the steps that are where you're not giving the, the antibiotic where you should be giving the antibiotic. So anything that's routine, you can systematize and you can get much better outcomes associated with it. So the real challenge, and this is really what that second part of the law was about, the real challenge is how do you translate a system which is completely haphazard, that is, has essentially nothing to do with this kind of chart, is really all about a doctor doing what he or she thinks is right, given their own personal circumstance and whatever else is going on. And we know that at best, half the time goes the way that the clinical guidelines suggest it should go. How do you translate that into a system that works the right way all the time for people? So that's going to be the fundamental challenge over the next decade. What we know from economics is that it's going to require three sorts of things. It's going to require an enormous IT investment. Susan Denser once said that uh, electronic medical records are the third major religion in America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the fourth major religion behind what were the top three? Christianity? Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and electronic health records. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to believe, however, that she is absolutely wrong and that she forgot former Boston Red Sox fans <laughs> as, <laughs> as, uh, as one of those. So it's going to require enormous information technology. It's going to require paying differently. The reason why all those boxes are separate is because they are paid for separately. So a primary care doctor gets paid for separately from a specialist who gets paid for separately from a hospital and so on. And it's going to require very, very fundamental changes in the organizations. So for example, your typical hospital in the country now spends a third of its waking time thinking about how am I going to get more patients. And what they really ought to be spending two-thirds of their time thinking about is how do I get fewer patients because I've treated them better so that they don't need to come to me. So it's going to be an absolutely huge transformation. There are differing views about how that will happen, ranging from the right to the far right to the extreme right, uh, and a little bit to the left. Um, the sort of extreme right view is that this will happen the way that it happens in other industries by getting insurers out of the way and having people buy health care the way they buy cars and computers and um, food and things like that. The somewhat less extreme uh, 
right view of that is that it'll happen because insurers will figure out the best way to make it happen for people. So they will tell people where they should go and where they shouldn't go and they will get providers into shape. And that's why you see a lot of sort of get rid of the traditional Medicare program and get private insurers to run the traditional Medicare program. The far left view is that this won't happen with private insurance and it's really not going to happen with private incentives. So you need a single payer model to deal with this. The view that was most predominant in the legislation, which is the one that I, I think most health economists would, would support, is the one that says that the payments are a big problem and the biggest problem of all is Medicare. So let's change the Medicare program to make, encourage concentration on better care management. So how do you do that? If there are circumstances where people become acutely ill, um, then just give one price to do that. So think about all the services that someone needs when they're acutely ill. Uh, they have a, a stroke, they need care for the stroke, the initial care, ongoing care, rehabilitation, medication, all of that. Some put someone in charge of managing that, give them a budget, and say, go for it. And if you can come in better and cheaper because you can figure out a better way to get to this person, then you can make money off of them. Similarly, do the same thing for people as a whole. Just say, look, there are people, they need medical care, they're healthy, they're in different stages of health, we want you to work with them. And you doctors figure out how to deal with them. And the key point here is that what a lot of this does, and, w and the way that I think the system is going to go, is to put in doctors' hands the care for people. Get rid of all of this, we'll pay you if you do this, we'll pay you more if you do that, we won't pay you if you do this. Just say, here's a bucket of money for a patient in a particular circumstance or at a particular stage in their life, and you go ahead and deal with them. And do it well, and you'll do well. Do it well both in terms of saving money or in terms of high quality metrics based on some metrics we'll define, and we'll let you make money. Do it poorly, and you'll, you're going to be at risk for a lot of very high spending. So figure out how to run this. It's going to be um, an immense, immense change. And, and I think it's going to happen with or without the Affordable Care Act. Certainly the Affordable Care Act is pushing a lot in this direction. The Medicare program has already started this. It's already started this. It's moving in a lot of direction, a lot of ways along these lines. Private insurers are moving the same way. There's not a hospital executive in the country who does not see this in their future. There's not a physician group in the country that does not see somehow this in their future. So that's, um, that's at least one version of the future. I can't resist just ending with advice from two famous economists um, about uh, why this will have to happen. One is by an old economist. He's actually passed away named Herb Stein, who uh, said, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. You understand why we're held in such high regard. And the second is by uh, an economist who you might not have heard of named Jerry Garcia. And Professor Garcia said, somebody has to do something and it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. <laughs> but that I suspect is where the next decade will lie, which is in addition to the coverage and the playing out on the state level, is somebody is going to have to do something. It is going to be dumped in the lap of the doctors, I believe. And they're going to have to figure out how to do it well. And if they do, it'll be remarkably good. And if not, boy, is it going to be really messy. Thanks very much, David. Um, we're now going to turn to Marjorie and Joe, who will take up a number of important topics, including Medicaid, the exchanges, uh, accountable care organizations, and what the ACA means for consumerism. So it's really, you have the bucket. Joe or Marjorie, who wants to I think I'll start. Um, and again, I think I'm going to take this at a local level, but at least at New York State, um, because we are at a really advantageous position given what our uh, government has been doing in planning for and moving forward with implementation of the law as it was enacted and now as it has been validated by the court. Um, with that said, um, everyone in this room knows there is still a lot to do to get us from here to a point where uh, certainly the state has to, by November of this year, submit a blueprint for approval by CMS um, for the operation of this exchange to get approval in uh, 2013, to be operable uh, by October 2013, 
and to start uh, enrolling people in January 2014. That feels like it's far away, and we all know that it's not. Um, with that said, the court's decision really did not have, in practical implications, a big uh, effect on what New York State is going to be doing. Um, the governor has moved ahead and issued an executive order in April. Um, we will have a health benefit exchange by virtue of that executive order. That benefit exchange will follow the mandates of the Affordable Care Act in facilitating enrollment, in handling um, the provision of advanced premium tax credits. In fact, the governor issued a letter most recently this month uh, to CMS saying that uh, this exchange in New York State would handle the issuance of uh, the, the tax credits. Um, also, beyond that, the state has been actively studying with the help of many great minds uh, some of the key decisions that have to be made to make the exchange most effective. Um, whether there will be merger of the markets, what plan will form the benchmark plan for essential health benefits, um, other issues with regard to the level of the exchange being an active purchaser or more of a clearinghouse as it has been. So all of those are uh, decisions that are going to be well done, but well done in a very truncated time frame. Um, but I think the thing that I want to call attention to really goes back to the slide that Susan um, showed at the, almost the end of her presentation about the reaction of the public to the law. Um, the public is all over the place um, in terms of its understanding of, reaction to, and hence ability to act on the promise of the ACA. And to some extent, that is where we at HRA and we at my office live. The issue of outreach and education for the individuals who need to be driven into exchanges around the country, but particularly in New York State, into an exchange that will be viable, self-sufficient, and that will have the potential to drive the kind of improvements in quality and cost over time because it will have a volume of lives um, and a, a marketplace. Um, th there is no mistaking how much work we have to do in really helping people understand the value of the act for their health, for their household, and for their pocketbooks. Um, and we in New York City have spent a lot of time doing that kind of work at various levels. Certainly in my office, you mentioned the HealthSat initiative that we operate and have operated for over a decade, um, and really working at local levels, and a lot of healthcare delivery and coverage is local, um, figuring out the tools and resources that you have and bringing them to bear efficiently and effectively to get messages and assistance to individuals and business owners, because when we talk about the uninsured, we are also talking about small businesses and those who work for small businesses who cannot afford and have had a real issue with affordability of coverage for a while. So um, in thinking about how we move ahead, that issue of outreach and education, I think, cannot be minimized. Um, and, and I find it interesting that I'm seeing now, over the last couple of months, the CMS ads about the prevention um, portion of the act and encouraging folks to think about prevention. Those are the kind of things that we really have to do actively now. Bring out the various benefits um, as well as the requirements and make them tangible and intelligible for the public. Um, I think the other thing that has to be done is um, a real look at the resources that are available across the state and locally in any state um, and bring them to bear because there is not a lot of time. There's not a lot of time to create, recreate the wheel as far as it involves outreach and education. A lot is going to be spent on building exchanges and all of the, um, the electronics of that and the systems of that and the infrastructure. But outreach and education really needs to be built on some of the foundations that, that exist already. Um, in our case, we have uh, the Human Resources Administration that has been, that has been administering uh, Medicaid locally um, up to a point where we've successfully implemented a lot of the advances that New York State has made with 
the eligibility thresholds for public health insurance over time. And we now have enrolled over 3 million New Yorkers in Medicaid. Um, we do that well because we've taken advantage of electronic capacities, being able to scan and use documents to facilitate enrollment and allowing people to enroll electronically. I think the city is one of the only places that has an electronic renewal process. We process uh, 40,000, 80,000 applications a month, 40,000 renewals. Um, and think of the volume that will be coming through the exchange. Um, we also, we, OCHIA, have a web tool that is a health insurance decision support tool that allows New Yorkers, both individuals and small businesses, to find and compare health insurance. And we know that making that information easily accessible and tangible for them to make a decision is going to be a real challenge. Um, we know the state is working hard on it. Um, but we also know that the benefit of doing that well is that people are equipped to act wisely. Thanks very much, Marjorie. Joe? Sure, thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, what's, what the good news is already um, and some of the challenges ahead for consumers and focusing primarily on the Medicaid and, and uh, the Medicare program uh, as well and how that intersects in New York. But there's over 160,000 uh, younger people now that the ACA has allowed uh, parents to keep their kids on their policy after age 26. That's meant 160,000 young adults in New York have coverage. Um, over 3,400 uh, New Yorkers with pre-existing conditions are on the, what's called the bridge plan affordable coverage. So I mean there are tangible results in New York already. For seniors, as you know, one of the uh, provisions of the Affordable Care Act closes the so-called donut hole, the gap in prescription drug coverage. So in New York in, in 2011, uh, we had over 230,000 seniors uh, get the 50% discount on their prescription drugs in the donut hole. This was very important because, you know, in our experience, seniors had stopped taking their medications when they hit the donut hole, started cutting pills, all the things that we saw before we had a prescription drug plan. Um, they saved around $160 million uh, for themselves, um, and about 2 million New Yorkers received pre, pre preventive care under the Affordable Care Act. And as you can imagine, HHS has all of those statistics for every state in the nation uh, to tout the benefits of the Affordable Care Act. And what it did not do is kind of just as important as what it did do. Um, you know, David had a slide on this, and we've heard this Obamacare guts the Medicare program in order to provide coverage for people under 65. All you seniors should be up in arms. Um, it doesn't do that. Um, there are no access to care issues uh, to folks uh, with Medicare because of the Affordable Care Act. And one of the big poster children uh, for this was the Medicare Advantage program. Uh, these are Medicare HMOs and other private Medicare plans. You know, supposedly with a rollback in their, what I would argue were excessive uh, reimbursement rates, was going to mean they were going to leave the market, they were going to start charging premiums, cut their benefits, you know, silver sneakers program out the window. Um, and we just finished a report for the United Hospital Fund uh, that they uh, supported us in doing, showing in New York that certainly wasn't the experience um, in the first year that uh, premiums were rolled back, um, and that it also reflected the national trend as well, uh, that that did not happen. And I think for a number of reasons. One is, you know, plans are still being paid very well. There's bonus payments now available to plans that are doing a good job, so they want to stay in the program to see if they can suck up that money. And I think, uh, thirdly, uh, they see the AC, ACA coming down the road, and th this is not the time they want to leave the Medicare program because they, they see their ability to cover people from cradle to grave. So, um, you know, that is, I think, an important message that needs to get out about what didn't happen. These disaster scenarios have not come to pass. Another positive um, thing for New York State uh, that we've been able to take advantage, and once again, New York State Health Foundation and United Hospital Fund and others in this room were supportive of this, and that is um, our, uh, the formation of a consumer assistance uh, program here in New York under the ACA through the aegis of the Community Service Society, MRC, and a host of organizations are, are part of that, really institutionalizing for the first time uh, the ability of consumers to be engaged um, in education and ombudsman type and advocacy efforts. Um, if you get your um, explanation of benefits from your uh, insurer, uh, it has a phone number on the back of it. 
uh, and that, our, that 800 number rings at CSS and it either gets handled there or referred to one of our agencies. Uh, if you happen to be a person with Medicare, it gets sent to us. So um, and an interesting thing that we were talking a little bit about here, we have gotten more money in that program in New York because other states have rejected their money. Um, you know, for example, we got a bump last year because Colorado said no. Um, and so uh, for those of you in other states, uh, you know, this is an area, once again, if you're interested in consumer empowerment, if your state isn't taking advantage of this, um, you know, shame on them uh, because uh, it is an incredible opportunity, once again, to, to fund and institutionalize these, uh, these things. Um, David did a good job of talking about the innovative care models, and once again, New York is a, a, a little bit ahead of the pack on accountable care organizations, health homes. One area where New York has really leaped ahead as well and is, is Jason Helgerson, our Medicaid director, was testifying down at the Senate Aging Committee yesterday about our DUELS uh, initiative. Um, and uh, this is an area we recently received uh, funding from New York State Health Foundation in a coalition that we put together of both disabled and aging groups to really organize consumers around this issue to once again bring them into the context of either managed care, uh, health homes, or kind of managed fee-for-service hybrid in, in health homes, I should say, um, to coordinate the care of dual eligibles, people that are eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare. You would think that they got double coverage, but actually what they get are a lot of cracks, and they fall through them, and it's incredibly expensive. The reason it needs to be brought together as well, simple illustration and the most uh, you know, clear one, and given David's uh, excellent presentation, uh, if you're in the Medicaid program, you happen to be in a nursing home, uh, there is no disincentive for the Medicaid program to send you to the hospital because Medicare picks up the hospital bill. Um, and so why invest in better care in the nursing home to keep people out of the hospital when you can shift costs to the federal program uh, for a period of time? So also, why should Medicaid take better care of somebody in a primary care setting um, if it leads to a hospitalization that, once again, will be paid for by Medicare? We don't see any savings there. Why should we invest in our Medicaid? So bringing Medicaid programs, so bringing those two streams together is important. In New York, a lot of issues about, you know, whether this is, you know, patients are protected in this, but moving ahead must happen, you know, given the quotes that we saw. Um, and uh, we need to start experimenting. And so, uh, you know, empowering consumers to be part of that is, as I think New York State Health Foundation and other foundations want to do nationally, I think will be an important thing you see over the course of the next few years because it's not just, you know, as providers change and as Marjorie was saying, consumers need to be brought along and need to be part of it and not resistant to it, um, uh, uh, you know, willy-nilly uh, based on ignorance. Um, so the impact on New York, uh, I want to talk a little bit about our new enrollment and eligibility systems because not every place is as far along as New York City in the state. Also, the exchange will be an integrated exchange with both Medicaid and um, the, uh, the plans uh, for folks above the Medicaid, the subsidized plans. And uh, what's great about that is it starts to erode this idea that Medicaid is a welfare program. You know, you're in the exchange with everybody else, and that's a good thing. It's about health insurance coverage. One of the little, uh, you know, blips in that is that once again, this Medicaid coverage expansion is for people under the age of 65. There's still folks with Medicaid over 65, and um, it, we were very concerned about uh, the over 65 population not getting the advantage of streamlined eligibility and enrollment system, that our caboose would be left on a siding. We would be stuck with the East German computer program that New York <laughs> uses now for its Medicaid um, eligibility and enrollment, and everybody else would be using, you know, the I don't know what nationality has the best program now, but the, the Apple program, right? Um, and so, um, once again, New York State Health Foundation enabled us to uh, fund work for, that we did in the context of the Medicaid redesign team here in New York. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on outside the ACA in New York and other states. Uh, but it enabled us to, to um, really get in there with the Medicare concerns and make sure that people with Medicare would also be involved in the, and would also take the, get the benefit of those new en enrollment and eligibility systems. And that's something that needs to happen in every state. Uh, the feds have given them the right, um, also did federal advocacy with other groups on that. But, you know, it's really the states need to be pushed there. Um, I think, you know, certainly what we see and what Urban Institute has seen um, that, the, that the exchange can do here in New York 
is, uh, you know, the projections that they have the cost of individual insurance will drop in New York State by 66 percent. Um, the cost of small business insurance uh, will cost by 5 to 22 percent. I've talked to some of you in the room about your own small business policies and why are they going up so much. Um, we feel your pain too. Uh, Medicare Rights Center every year, you know, it seems like we get swallowed with a 10 or 15 percent um, increase. Maybe it gets, uh, you know, bartered down to 9 percent, but it really is uh, a, a tough uh, 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 road to hoe there. And of course, the other thing that we're looking forward to uh, is this Medicare donut hole to being totally eliminated for seniors um, in the year 2020. I think certainly another challenge that we're now dealing with, and, and once again, this was work that we started under the New York State Health Foundation grant, the initial uh, grant, was what is going to be the pass off um, for uh, folks going into Medicare from the exchange. Um, so the Massachusetts exchange hasn't dealt with this. Uh, it's kind of like you fall out of the exchange and you're on your own. Um, but, you know, really if we're talking, in the, you know, the, the key word here always is seamlessness of care. Um, and right now a lot of people, when they talk about the ACA, they talk about the three stools, of, uh, the three legs of the stool, which is Medicaid, employer-based health insurance, which isn't going away anytime soon, and the exchange policies. I like to say there's a fourth leg to that, and it's Medicare. And to make sure that you know, folks have the appropriate counseling getting out of the exchange, and they're not just willy-nilly falling into the managed care plan or Medicare Advantage plan uh, that they happen to be in, you know, the same sponsor plan when they were under 65. That may not be right for them. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about and some of the nitty-gritty, if you will, at a certain point that we're going to be dealing with as the exchange gets up and running. Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, lastly, very briefly, we're going to turn to the 2013 budget as it relates to Medicare, Medicaid, and the NIH appropriations. And Jim, would you uh, kick that off, please, and then we'll get other people? Pardon? You were going to do it first, weren't you? Yeah. Oh, you were to, okay. Yeah, great. I just, I, I have just a few things to show you, although I'll be, I'll be very, very brief. There, but just to, to alert you to the issue, there, there are two fiscal problems for the federal government. One which we've been talking about is the long range budget, which is that health costs are exploding and that's a big issue for the for the budget over time. Um, and that's true for, at the federal level and state and local levels as well. But the second one, which is going to hit more immediately, is what people call the fiscal cliff, which is that at the end of this year, the Bush tax cuts, which were all enacted with a sunset date, will expire. The payroll tax holiday to um, help us recover from the recession will expire. Extended UI benefits will expire. And there is a sequester that will hit the defense programs, military programs, and uh, selected non-defense programs. And all of this is scheduled to happen on January 1st of 2013. If all of those happened, what you get is an enormous um, reduction in spending and increase in taxes, so the federal deficit would go down, which over time would be a very good thing. But if your economy is very weak, what you get is a recession. So when analysts calculate what is the probability that the economy goes back into a recession, a very big deal in that is what happens with the fiscal cliff. And do we, what do we do as regards the tax components and the spending components? What's going to happen, I think, well, obviously will very strongly depend on who wins the election. So if the two most likely scenarios would be Obama wins the presidency and the Republicans either control both houses of Congress or at least one house of Congress, in which case the Affordable Care Act will stay, but there will be pressure to do either a real budget or a nickel and dime budget. And I'll, I'll, I'll be slightly more precise about what a nickel and dime budget is. If uh, Governor Romney is elected and there's a Republican Congress, it will be the, the Affordable Care Act he has said he will repeal on day one or day a half or whatever. Um, and then there will be huge cuts in health programs, especially for the low income population that I think Marjorie and Joe and, and, and Jim will just find, you know, make, make their life incredible hell. Um, what most people would like to do is to do the things we 
talked about, um, that is Republicans would kind of like to use more insurance choice and more consumer choice and Democrats would kind of like to um, put people in single payer plans or um, uh, change Medicare operations. But what happens is none of these get get majority support. So consumer choice, I mean, Joe could talk about what that means for elderly people in terms of ability to choose plans or ability to make decisions about medical care. Um, many of the things I was telling you were a good idea were what were called death panels um, a year and a half ago. I always wanted to run one, by the way. I thought that was what I could be best at. Uh, single payer is politically not viable. And on top of this, the, the official scoring agencies don't give any credit for most of these because they don't, they're not sure that most of these will actually save money. So if you really need to save money, what you do is you find something that the government is paying and you cut the price that it pays for it. So you take hospitals, oh, they don't need so much more money, so let's, they don't need so much money to care for patients, so let's reduce that. Physicians, you know, there's this thing where every two weeks we vote to delay by two weeks the, the <laughs> cut in physician payments. Well, so maybe you don't do all of that. You cut home health agency, Medicare um, Advantage plans. The NIH in the, the budget from the Republican House is frozen. The CDC's budget is cut. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is zeroed out along with a few other, other things. Um, so, so that's, this is a sort of nickel and, this is what a nickel and dime budget looks like, is basically find everything on the table and just cut it. Um, and that's a, that's, you know, one, one scenario for what happens, particularly if Obama is reelected and the um, Congress remains Republican, they may not be able to agree on bigger changes and they may just say, okay, look, we need to find $300 billion of savings from Medicare and Medicaid, so we'll, do those sorts of things. If the Republicans are elected, then you know, then really look out because it's going to be immense changes for vulnerable populations, for seniors, um, for medical research and things. So it's going to have an immense. What happens next by, by next February or March or maybe through August will have an immense implication for the future um, of healthcare. Um, if I were in charge of the world, which no one ever offered that to me, um, I would try and restructure the programs kind of along the lines that we were talking about. But um, uh, I fear we are in danger of breaking one of the rules, which I told you was a rule, which is that if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. We are thinking of violating that. The question is what happens if you, if you, if you actually do. Um, so we may, di we, may di we may discover that. That's just a little. Yeah, I mean that was great, uh, a, a great presentation, uh, and I, I would just add a little bit to it. Uh, maybe, maybe three things. One, kind of setting up what happens after the election. Uh, you have the sequester trillion dollars uh, or more. You have the assumption that all of those tax cuts uh, go away and are repealed. And that really uh, helps out on the deficit, but I think most economists would indicate uh, at a level of shock to the economy uh, that ultimately uh, can't uh, be sustained. And so if you're going to buy back some of the tax cuts, then you've got to figure out how to go deeper on the spending side in order to get the thing into balance. I mean, that, that's my arithmetic. I think they actually knows how to do this stuff. Uh, the sequester had a 2% across the board for Medicare. Uh, and it also had no, nothing for Medicaid. It protected Medicaid. So assume that that's the floor in the discussion. Uh, and wherever this balance goes, you're going to see some further pressure on price. And over on the Medicaid side, the pressure is going to be framed in terms of the, uh, the, this block grant uh, discussion. Now, the Republicans are ready to go there uh, immediately. The Democrats are wobbly on this because you will find in any given period of time any number of Democratic governors who will be perfectly happy to take a block grant from Washington because it's going to give them more flexibility on their watch. Uh, understand what block grant and what flexibility means. 
uh, having spent an awful lot of years on the, in the Medicaid program. It means that you can have waiting lists for people to get services. There is no other magic out there that somebody can do that isn't already allowable under Medicaid or particularly under Medicaid with all the waiver possibilities that exist under current law. So there, anybody who talks about block grants equal flexibility, no magic. It simply means you'll be able to serve fewer people. And obviously, the, this maintenance of effort provision that was in the Affordable Care Act <laughs> is something that at least some of the folks hoped that the decision made go away. I don't, I don't think it does, because they want to cover fewer people. So there's going to be more pressure on the spending side. On Medicaid, we're going to feel it in the block grant debate. You can't count totally on the Democratic votes on that. Ultimately, uh, at Obama White House, uh, has a lot of pressure going forward. How uh, a Romney presidency plays with this, I, I think we really go off into a, a very new environment. Now, I do think, and as I said at the beginning, that the half a dozen governors now jumping in, uh, Governor Perry and, and colleagues jumping in on the Medicaid expansion, has is now reframing this discussion to say we're actually not going to be committed to the coverage. Uh, and I think that that opens up to all the other constituencies that are out there, whether you're the business community, uh, or whether you're the religious community or whatever, you've got to look at that one and say, now what does that, the, we've been working in the, in the middle with some tough edges in the debate, it's pulled to the right, but it's, to me, it's new to have significant leaders in the country fundamentally saying we're going to leave people by the side of the road. Uh, and, uh, and I think, personally, I think that's the bluster of a campaign. Uh, but, you know, you, you got to take seriously what people, uh, what, what people say. Uh, I guess the, the final point that I would do in all of this, keep a very close eye on the question of reductions in appropriations or reductions in budgets or reductions in program expenditures versus reduction in total cost. Because in a little bit of a sense here, if an employer has a problem with insurance premiums, I can solve that problem, just give the person less insurance. Reduce my premium payment if I'm the employer, have my employee pay more. <clears throat> and pre if premiums are the problem, there's ways of solving it, but that's not the same thing as changing the total cost structure. And I apply that big time to the Medicaid debate. Because as we're talking about, excuse me, to the Medicare debate, as we're talking about the future of these various approaches on Medicare, look carefully at whether I am reducing the federal government's outlays for the Medicare program, but at what cost to reducing the total cost which ultimately are borne back by the beneficiary and government. But if I reduce the government side of it, and if I haven't adequately pulled back on total expenditures, then that is simply a cost shift to the, to the beneficiary. And ultimately, the dilemma here of a middle, in, a middle income population that's had a flat income growth over a generation and healthcare costs are continuing to grow, that there's not much more room to squeeze there without the system tipping over. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, given the time, I think what we'll do is go to the last point, which is a question that I've asked all panel members to think about. Uh, you have a room full of people in philanthropy. What is the one or two things, uh, ideas, that you would recommend that they consider funding? Susan, let me start with you. I, I have three. Okay. <laughs> First of all, as you've heard, uh, there is a crying need to support education and awareness of the, uh, you know, we won't ask people to understand the entirety of the Affordable Care Act, but what we do need to ask people to understand is that they will have new options to purchase coverage. They are going to get assistance depending on their income to do that through the federal subsidy structure. Uh, and it's going to be easier. <laughs> for them because as you heard, you know, what are exchanges going to be for most Americans? Websites. 
it's going to be a website. So you will be able to sit in your home, go online, compare insurance options in a way that you cannot meaningfully do today, fill in a, some data, and the kind of nifty website that uh, Marjorie was describing in effect means you'll be able to go online, input your information, and it will tell you you are eligible for Medicaid and we are routing you over to this side of the website versus you are eligible for private insurance and here's the amount of your subsidy, here's what you have to pay, here are your choices, they're all standardized in front of you and it will be almost as easy as booking a flight on you know, uh, Travelocity today and probably even a little bit easier than that. And people don't understand that that is what is in front of them. So to the degree that you can make people aware this is what you're, in fact, I, Peter Lee, who runs the California Exchange, is tr coming up, trying to come up with a different word than exchange to tell people what it is. But I think if you tell people, would you like to have a really cool new website that ha makes all this easy for you? Um, here's what it will be. And, you know, very importantly, these subsidies, assuming that the law is not repealed, these subsidies will be available to you and you will be able to enroll next October. October 2013, open enrollment starts. So to get people aware of this, signing up on October 1st of 2013 is going to be very important and helping people. And when we put in place under Medicare the Part D program, the amount of education and hand-holding, et cetera, that was going on at the Medicare Rights Center and other places was enormous and enormously helpful to people. So to the degree that philanthropy can gear up to educate and help that enrollment process, it'll be key. Just quickly, the, two, the other uh, supporting enrollment uh, will be created. And then support the delivery system reform pieces. Um, do whatever you can to, first of all, make people aware there are lots of good people out there now trying to make health care better and cheaper. Um, and David had a slide, cost quality trade-off. The evidence doesn't show it's a trade-off. The evidence shows you can do both. You can lower the cost and improve the quality. So help engage people in understanding we're going to be moving to new ways of getting health care. If they work, they're going to be cheaper and people are going to get better health care. And we already have the evidence, for example, in Massachusetts, where because of 98% coverage in Massachusetts, 99% for children, what has happened? Uh, use of the ERs that is unnecessary is going down. HIV infections are down. Um, Medicaid was mandated to cover uh, smoking cessation in Massachusetts. ER visits related to uh, tobacco-related disease down. People are getting healthier, and it's because of the coverage is happening and the delivery system is starting to reform itself, all those things that David talked about. So the degree you can help people understand this and engage in this uh, will be very important. Thanks. Uh, Joe? Um, a, a couple things. One is, and Susan and I were talking a bit, little bit about this, um, and you know, United Hospital Fund and New York State Health Foundation have been engaged in this, and that is building up state infrastructure. Um, and this needs to happen across the country. Um, you know, th all of this change is happening at a time when uh, almost every state worker I know and worked with has retired um, or is considering retiring. Um, in this demographic wave, um, and there's not a lot of new people coming up behind them. And, of course, a, a state's under tremendous pressure to trim their civil service roles. Um, so, you know, uh, we need a partner at the state to engage. Plans need a partner. Providers need a partner. Um, so to the extent that, you know, the state infrastructure can be bolstered, um, which has been done, I think, incredibly by philanthropy in, in New York State, that needs to continue. And it also, I think, consumer groups uh, need the infrastructure as well to become better partners. And so a lot of funding, I think, could go there to consortiums of consumer groups that can pull themselves together and kind of institutionalize what they're doing uh, and, and, you know, be there for the long run. Um, secondly, I think in, in, in states outside of New York, this issue of, you know, Jim talked about the battle for Medicaid expansion is going to occur over this decade as well. I mean, we're also going to have to fight back the battle to block grant Medicaid, but 
Um, so they're the same battle, as it were. Um, but certainly, um, if uh, the stars align and we have the ACA moving forward, uh, there's still going to be recalcitrant states, and we need to bring them along. And, and once again, I think consumer and provider and consumer coalitions um, need to be uh, fostered. I think this is an era um, of, um, and you've, you've seen it kind of in what we talked about. We haven't really talked about it. There's a lot of shifts happening, but I think one of the shifts really is providers and consumers uh, realizing that their interests are aligned in a way that they haven't been for a while. Um, and even providers, plans, and consumers feeling like if we don't grab this together, it's going to slip out of our control uh, completely, and you know the barbarians uh, are going to be uh, plundering healthcare, uh, and we're not going to be in charge of it. So I think there's an opportunity to bring these forces that are somewhat uncomfortable with each other, or, or very uh, you know work against each other in many situations together. And then finally, you know. Medicare reform. I mean, you've heard it, and I don't think people, it's in people's minds what's really happening here, and Jim said it in, in his way, but basically every proposal that's out there that's not an ACA-related Medicare delivery system reform that David talked about is a cost shift. Um, it's either a cost shift to the state or it's a cost shift to employers, i.e. have them stay on employers' plans until they're 67, or, or to consumers, i.e., have them buy individual policies until they're 67, which, as you can imagine, are, even with subsidies, could be more expensive than Medicare. Um, and certainly a lot of the other things, you know, this whole skin in the game. And what I say is half of people with Medicare have incomes under $25,000 a year. If they're putting more skin in, it's their scalp. Um, and so that message has to be gotten across as we, these are real people. Um, these are real uh, programs that help people uh, directly in, in and, and I say to baby boomers, younger baby boomers, um, like myself, uh, you know, my father used to send my grandmother a check for $200 every month uh, to cover her prescriptions. So, you know, get ready uh, if some of these programs are implemented for Medicare to, you know, be able to help out your parents or help out your, you know, look up your 401k again or 403b. Thanks, Joe. Marjorie? We've all talked a lot about all of the positives um, coming out of the Affordable Care Act. And in terms of thinking about um, what philanthropy can do, I want to highlight some challenges. Um, we know reform does a lot for many populations, but there are some who are left out. And some of the key populations for New York State and some other states are immigrants and particularly the undocumented. Um, they will still be in need of care. They will still be seeking out service at safety net organizations. Um, they will need clear and clarity about what is and is not available to them um, as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so I, I want to point to that need in terms of information as, as Susan kind of uh, ratified uh, that priority with me, um, but also support of safety net organizations who will need to stand strong at a time when, as a part of the Affordable Care Act, as there is a reduction in the uninsured, they will be losing dish money and other resources. Um, I also want to highlight the fact that there is a lot of public money on the table um, in the operation of exchanges, in the availability of tax credits, et cetera, which highlights the need for effective program integrity. Um, looking at ways that states and the localities that will be working with them and that will have to work with them as they continue to operate human service and social service programs um, will need to be able to find, root out early um, and prevent fraud um, and abuse and its expense. Um, so those kind of innovative solutions, be they electronic or others, will need support. And then attendant to that, we are building a whole new infrastructure with regard to coverage for Americans. Um, certainly in New York State, this is different than what um, individuals have become accustomed to. On the public side, many individuals are used to relying on their local social service district, um, and that is going to change dramatically in New York State. But many of them will still rely on their localities for benefits that are important to them, particularly the poor and near poor food stamps, cash assistance, the communication between exchanges and human and social service programs so that folks get all the benefits they're entitled to and don't slip through 
perhaps new cracks that we create, will also need support. Um, and finally, I'm going to come back to the issue of the message, because the issue of language access in the message is critical. We are a diverse country. We are certainly a diverse state. Um, and the level of sophistication, both literacy and cultural sophistication that has to come with the message about an exchange and or Medicaid, information to mixed immigration status families where one member of the family will be able to realize the promises of an exchange and others will not. All of those things have to be carefully messaged so that we do not create new barriers that we've been spending many years to try to eliminate. Thanks very much, Marjorie. Let me ask, uh, David, do you have anything to add? And, and then Jim? Just, um, uh, I worry the most that we will bifurcate healthcare into the haves and the have-nots, both at the patient level, that is, the people who have really good access to the system and those who don't, and at the provider level, that is, the providers that can survive well and those that can't. And the, the thing I most worry about in my mind is repeating the experience about when Walmart took over retail. So, you know, you used to have all sorts of little local retail shops and stuff, and then Walmart came in. And one of the consequences of that is that prices fell a lot, which is very good for people. We all get things much cheaper and so on. But it created enormous turmoil for every retailer that could not keep up with Walmart. And you had you know, story after story about towns that were decimated because Walmart came in and the traditional employer left. Imagine if we repeated that in the hospital industry or the healthcare industry or the home health industry or the nursing home industry. And you had you know, towns outside of New York City or even some of the less prestigious hospital in New York, less prestigious hospitals in New York City saying we're going to go under because we can't figure out how to adapt to this. That would be just an absolute disaster. And so we've got to figure out how to bring everybody along as we do this so that n nobody is left behind. I agree we should have brought more in, but even those who are in, we can't leave them behind. I, I want to, you know, affirm a lot of what was said. Uh, I think in terms of the enrollment processes and stuff like that, and to go to the specific question here, foundations, uh, where might uh, foundations go? Um, I think there's going to be a lot of support for the exchanges and, and a fair amount of resources, plenty of work to be done there. But I, I'd, I'd, I'd go back to David's slide about the, you know, the way you potentially take a third of the costs out of the system. Uh, that kind of was the, the premise on which this was all done. Uh, and I mean, just recognize that. Everybody knew that we had this long going problem that sets us aside from every other industrial country of not covering people. Let's step up to the plate politically and try to do something. It was an imperfect solution, but it was a big step forward. Part of the underlying deal was a recognition on behalf of a broad uh, uh, range of interests in healthcare that we understood the fragmented nature of service delivery and we looked at it and fundamentally said, you know, Pursuing quality, getting better coordination could in fact also have a positive impact on, on cost reduction. That is the big bet that's here. The last time we tried to do this in the mid-90s, we called it managed care. Uh, and uh, tip my hat to the insurance companies, they really screwed it up. Uh, <laughs> and perhaps they screwed it up because they were immediately looking at bottom line and also, I will argue, they didn't have the information technology to be able to manage that level of complexity. We are into this discussion now and come back from the consumer, from the patient's point of view. We're going to see some differences in the way in which we receive our care. We're going to be looking at teams of providers. We're going to be working with organizations that are going to have broader responsibility that is going to be, there's going to be plenty of uh, interest groups that are going to play their margin here. This is a great idea, but protect me. Uh, and there's also the question here that we're going to have to come up to the issue. And I, you know, tip my hat to something like the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation that brings together multi-specialties, number of specialties, and says to the specialty, okay, tell us the five things that you do that border on worthless. Uh, and the, special, the medical specialties step up and publish on that subject. Uh, and now the question, future, looking across to consumers, 
uh, that's really critical stuff to be able to take a willing medical community and healthcare community and say, yeah, you know, there is stuff that we do. And a lot will say, well, we do it because you ask us for it or you demand it or the lawyers require it or something like that. But this is a place. Every time the, the preventive services uh, 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 group uh, comes out, the task force comes out with all the things that maybe, maybe we really don't need to do, Everybody pushes back, and a lot of that is motivated by the personal experience of people who benefited. There's plenty of interest group support. We just have to become more mature in understanding in order to get the payoff. Remember, it is the big play. The, the economics of this potentially work so much better if we can, in fact, get somewhere near that 30% of savings that are out there. Some of it relates to price reduction and, and things like that. We've got to better understand that in a more mature way. And right now, we simply have never been given that opportunity. I always remind people, have you ever seen something that's called, this is not a bill? Uh, and everybody gets this piece of paper that's called, this is not a bill. This is the principal communication you get from this system now, and it is designed to make certain that you will never understand a thing it says. Okay. So in this business of our all growing up and getting a better understanding of these changes, uh, they will be demonized uh, politically. They'll be demonized by interest groups. Uh, uh, that's a place where if I were to say uh, you want to make a new bet in this area, that's a place to make a bet. Thanks, Jim. Unfortunately, you know, we've only got just five minutes left for questions, but I do want to uh, ask the audience here and possibly the audience that... Uh, uh, are on the web or phone to, to ask uh, questions. So please, uh, does anybody have a burning question they'd like to ask? How about the phone or web? Okay, I'm going to ask mine then, <clears throat> to each of you. Uh, if there was one trend in the healthcare sector to watch over the next decade, what would it be? Can I ask you, David, first? Um. I will say the one thing to, that, that I will most watch, and it picks up directly where Jim left off, is how people are engaged, whether we can get people engaged in their own health care. And I actually have a nomination for the most important medical care um, technology of the next decade, I will. It's this yeah. thing here. So if this becomes the most important, Thing in dealing with your health care, then it'll have been a very, very good decade. And if the medical system looks approximately like it looks now a decade from now, it'll be a very bad one. Thank you. Joe? Um, I would certainly agree with that and, and echo, uh, you know, the whole, the, the delivery system reform piece of this and bringing consumers along. Because I think one of the you know, I think you're right, Jim, about the diagnosis of managed care, and, and it, this is a new opportunity, but we know, and your point about the, the demonization possibilities here, because you're right, there was a wonderful, the internists and the specialists came up with those five things. One of them was no lung uh, x-ray before surgery. The front page of the New York Times, the Heritage Foundation quote was, this is rationing, we should let patients and their doctors decide. Well, wait, their doctors are deciding. And, you know, patients and consumers being whipsawed between those things, um, not being aware of what the trade-offs are, uh, the sense that when we can have it all, we can have it all, except then we're going to block grant you, you know, um, and we're going to do it in the shadows. Um, and so if those, if we don't illuminate those shadows um, without scaring people, um, then those shadows are going to predominate and we're not going to have the rational system that I think we're, we're all saying that we need. Susan? I think it's going to be the uh, increased uh, identification of what individuals do with their own behavior to affect their health and the engagement of the healthcare system in helping people as early in life as possible to live as healthy lives as possible. I think it is Deepak Chopra, among others, who's identified that you can pretty much, depending on how you live your life up until about the age 30, you can pretty much determine uh, whether your life expectancy is going to be 60 or 65 or 90. 
pretty much by what you do in that period and into your 30s and 40s, that you just make a series of critical decisions about your health and your health status over that time that will determine your ultimate life expectancy. And to the degree that the healthcare system becomes more, uh, through accountable care organizations or whatever, a more em embracing of this notion of preservation of health and the importance of preserving health and maximizing health at every stage of life, a whole, a whole life cycle approach, uh, that will be very important. And it will require, as everybody has said, a very different way of engaging with a healthcare system and really, frankly, a health system in a way that could, uh, assuming that it is embracing of the whole of the population, which is a point everybody has stressed, and I would second, uh, assuming that that d does play out, uh, it, will, it will truly result in people living healthier lives. Thank you. Marjorie? I don't think I can really add much but ratify a lot of what all already has been said. I think, again, if we see consumer engagement at a real level where consumers see this as their system, and not someone else's, um, or the system that I have to use, um, but something that I can engage and in some respect um, influence um, in its delivery of care to me. Um, when we see that and we, see, we hear the voice of consumers in how the benefits of the Affordable Care Act and incremental changes in the system have benefited them, then I think we will see success. Jim? And I'll, and I'll just pick up those last two comments and sort of do the mirror image because everything that's moving forward here is the opportunity for people to become more uh, uh, engaged and to influence not only their engagement with the system but their own human health. And then the complementary challenge is the mirror image to avoid the demonization of the individual's problems uh, and to have a society that essentially says, you're the problem and if we could only step away from any obligation to you, uh, we've solved our problem uh, until uh, un until uh, individually uh, each of us runs into something we can't solve. It really is a matter, you have to keep coming back to it. The people in the healthcare system, the epiphany that they all had is we actually think we can solve this. And the epiphany of Governor Romney in Massachusetts was to say that stuff is personal responsibility. And they did the law. And we simply now have walked away from that consensus that existed just six years ago. Uh, and so balancing the, uh, the individual opportunity but the sense that it still is not we, not I, that it's we, not I, uh, is a question for the broader society. Uh, I've been involved in it long enough to know I, I, I respect the uh, uh, choices that the American people have. I am concerned, though, that it, it, in going back to the first comment, I turn that television on, I look at the headline, that headline may be right, it may be wrong, it so easily demonizes a problem in the society. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we got to get to be grown-ups if we're going to deal with this one and a few other problems that 21st century America is going to face. Thank you. Look, at, uh, let's give a hand to our panelists. And you, you all have been an exceptional audience, so thank you very, very much.